Hi, I'm Dr. Rajesh Chokhani, a general pediatrician from Bandra, Mumbai. And today we will be talking about fever means a lot in this series of lest we forget. So fever is the body's response to tissue damage and this tissue damage leads to chemical mediators being released which upregulate the hypothalamus. Consequently, body generates heat through active muscle contraction which is clinically perceived as rigors or conserves heat through peripheral vasoconstriction which is clinically perceived as chills and either or both these phenomena lead to an increase in the body temperature which is fever though both of them don't have any much localizing value as to the exact cause of fever. The commonest reason for tissue damage is inflammation which is very often due to infection but can also be due to non-infective inflammation examples being allergic, autoimmune or malignant disorders. Occasionally fever can be without inflammation as is seen in increased metabolic rate in hyperthyroidism or in central fever where there is a hypothalamic disturbance and the clinical clue is that the fever does not respond to any antipyretic or in autonomic system nervous system disturbances fever where the clinical clue is that there is no sweating or there is no lacrimation or in heat stroke where the clinical clue is that the skin is equally hot centrally or peripherally. So in other words there are many other causes of fever besides infection. Fever is always protective whatever its etiology. So in infection by increasing the blood supply to the affected areas it limits the replication of organisms and brings in immune cells and antibodies. In non-infective inflammation this very increase in blood supply helps in healing. Even in non-inflammatory conditions it alerts the patient and doctor both to find a cause. Fever itself just causes discomfort to the patient it does not harm the patient. So the key messages for antipyretic usage are to use it only when there is discomfort associated with fever and not at any particular temperature like 100 or 101. Use it at the peak of fever which is clinically recognized by the feeling of discomfort. Use the correct dose and use it on a need basis not round the clock. Paracetamol is the best antipyretic. Other drugs may bring down the fever faster. However, that is not our aim usually. What we are more worried about or concerned about is the underlying cause and whether that needs any specific action. So, we recommend to decide this underlying cause that we ask these following six questions and interpret their responses. First, question one, onset of fever. The first 12 to 24 hours should be considered as the onset of fever. If the fever is high at onset, it suggests a viral infection, a bacterial infection, malaria or an immune mediated fever. These bacterial infections which start with high fever are likely to localize early. Question 2. Response to paracetamol. If the response is poor, it suggests a bacterial infection. Question 3. Behavior in the interfebrile period. If with the effect of antipyretic the fever has reduced a little, but the patient continues to be sick, it suggests that the sickness was not just due to the high peak of fever, but it is due to the underlying disease. And this in turn points to a bacterial infection. Question 4. Pattern of fever. An erratic pattern of fever suggests malaria. In viral and bacterial infections, the fever usually follows a rhythmic pattern which corresponds with the wearing out of the effect of the antipyretic every 5 to 6 hours. Of course, in bacterial infections, the response itself to the antipyretic will be poorer. Sometimes, there is only one spike per day or two spikes per day. Such a pattern is seen in inflammatory disorders. Question 5. Trend of fever by day 3, day 4. In viral infections, it is usually getting better. It's worsening in bacterial infections and it remains the same in malaria or immune mediated fevers. Question 6. Accompanying symptoms. If these are generalized, it suggests viral infection. If they are localized, it suggests bacterial infection. 
the history of a contact in the family or in the surroundings suggests a viral infection. So very broadly, if a patient starts with very high fever, which is responsive to antipyretic, the patient is comfortable in the interfebrile period. The possibilities are it's a viral fever, a malaria or an immune-mediated fever. Now, if this fever follows the rhythm of the antipyretic administration, the trend is downward by day 3, day 4 and there are generalized symptoms, it's a viral fever. But if the fever has an erratic pattern and the trend is the same by day 3, day 4, it could be malaria. And if the rhythm is just one spike a day or two spikes a day and the trend remains the same by day 3, day 4, it could be an immune mediated fever. On the other hand, if this high fever is poorly responsive to antipyretic, the patient is sick even in the interfebrile period, the trend is worsening by day 3, day 4 and the localizing symptoms are localized, then it suggests a bacterial infection. At times, there is a rising trend of fever with these features which suggests that this is a bacteremic bacterial infection and we have to be on the lookout for localization of diseases like pneumonia, meningitis, typhoid, etc. Not all patients will have all these features and therefore in such situations, one will have to use an overall clinical judgment using whichever features are available. It is irrational to start an antibiotic in all patients of fever just because we are afraid that this may be a bacterial infection. On day one, day two, a diagnosis is possible in a few. Those that are obviously viral, those bacterial infections which localize early like acute tonsillitis or acute bacillary dysentery and the occasional malaria. In others with fever on day one, day two, but no diagnosis, our job is to rule out seriousness which is done by confirming through the history that there is no change in behavior and no oliguria and on examination of appearance, airway, breathing and circulation, there are no signs or no pointers to seriousness. Once seriousness has been ruled out, we have to wait for the evolution of the disease with symptomatic treatment only and watch carefully. Only in neonates or very young infants, immunocompromised patients and malnourished children, we may need to start treating a presumed bacterial infection even in the absence of a diagnosis. But before we start such treatment, we should always send relevant investigations. In all other cases, by day 3, day 4, by asking the questions which we just discussed, we are likely to reach a diagnosis in most cases. If we follow this approach, we will limit our usage of antibiotics to only those cases which are probable bacterial infections. If there is no diagnosis by day 3, day 4, we can take the help of relevant investigations also. As the fever prolongs beyond one week, we start thinking of viral infections that last longer, one example being Epstein-Barr virus, or bacterial infections that have been partially treated, or bacterial infections that take a while to localize or have very soft signs of localization like typhoid. By the second week of the illness, we also start considering chronic infections like tuberculosis. Beyond two weeks, rheumatological disorders and malignancy chances increase, but infections still remain. So these will be uncommon presentations of common infections or modified presentations of common infections due to partial treatment or occasionally uncommon infections. The textbook definition of fever of unknown origin is not very useful to clinicians because what it essentially tries to say is that after a probably random directionless evaluation, ticking all the boxes and drawing a blank all in all of those, we are now labeling this as fever of unknown origin. This does not show the way forward to the clinicians. So, what is more useful to clinicians is to develop a thought process as the duration of fever increases so that at different stages of the illness, appropriate evaluation can be done and less and less fevers will eventually fall in this category of 
fever of unknown origin so friends these were our key messages revision of fever fever definitely means a lot if we analyze it carefully thank you now the next video will be by dr khare on what does cough denote thank you